duty are getting worried about him. Last night, for example, he turned down a piece of his favorite pie. The other day, he even kicked that car he's always been so proud of. And is always writing figures of some kind on the backs of envelopes. No, this isn't like Jim at all. There must be something wrong. That magazine he was looking at, maybe that's a clue. Yes, that's the answer. Surprised you didn't guess, aren't you? Well, there's only one thing to do. Only one cure. And Mrs. Johnson is wise enough to know it. She knows the only medicine for this condition in the American male is this. The gleam of new chrome. The sparkle of new paint and that wonderful perfume that only comes from a new car. Yes, it's a familiar scene, one that's played every day all over America. And we're all better off because of it. You see, that beautiful new car and the way Jim Johnson feels about it are the symbols of a constant desire for something newer and better that is typical of all the Johnson families across the nation. And the competitive drive to satisfy that desire to build that better mousetrap is the force that has made the American marketplace the most abundant in the world. We in the automobile industry know the story. We helped write it. Under the spur of competition, of having to come up with something newer and better every year, the automobile industry has pointed the way for our whole economy, not only in mass production methods, but in long range thinking and planning. Yes, forward product planning putting in our showrooms the kind of cars and trucks and tractors that Jim Johnson and millions of people like him want and can buy is one of our biggest, toughest, and most important jobs here at Ford Motor Company. It's a tremendously complex job. It means getting the right answers to literally thousands of questions and interpreting them into a ton and a half of steel and glass and chrome. It's a job for experts, lots of them, it's a job that takes time and money, too. You don't put together a magnificent machine like this overnight. You don't plan and style and design and tool and build an automotive vehicle in a matter of months. Actually, years before Jim Johnson came into the showroom, this car was conceived in the minds of men at Ford Motor Company. This is how it happens. This is the story of product planning. Specifically, starting to develop the basic objectives for the advanced vehicle is the job of product planning personnel in the divisions. But planning a new vehicle is not simply dreaming up something that looks like a rocket on wheels and then manufacturing it. Even to decide the weight and general dimensions and specifications of the vehicle takes months of gathering data and analyzing them. Suppose you were starting out to plan a car or truck or tractor to put on the market four years from today. You'd need the answers to a good many questions before you attempt to do style and design that vehicle. These men get those answers. Market? Yes, a big question. Made up of thousands of smaller questions. What part of the market are we after? What share of the market are we trying to reach with this particular vehicle? Do we want to extend that? What kind of total automotive market will we have four, six, eight years from now? How many American families like the Johnsons will decide to buy a new car? What will they pay for it? And finally, most important, how many of them can we expect to buy Ford products? What part of that total market will go to Ford, to Lincoln, to Mercury? What share of the truck market should be Ford's? What share of the tractor market? Of course, saying it doesn't make it so. No share of this future market will be ours unless we earn it unless we put into that market a vehicle that will sell. That means more questions, more answers to be found. What kind of a car will get us the share we want of the future market? What features? What performance? What size? There's only one person who knows, the customer. So let's find out what he expects to get in his car or truck or tractor. What will the customer want? The best way, of course, is the most obvious. Ask him. Go into his home and ask him. 
Take the product to him and ask him. Talk to him on the telephone and ask him. Visit him on the job and ask him. Send him a questionnaire and ask him. What does the dealer council say? The dealer councils, elected representatives of Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealers all over America, meet with product and salespeople regularly to discuss our products. They get the answers where it counts most, on the sales floor, where the difference between success and failure is the customer's reaction to the car or truck or tractor we have produced. The dealer councils tell us how our present models are being accepted, where improvements might be made, what features the customer is interested in, what kind of performance he expects. And now the product division is ready for the big day. Gentlemen, our division would like to present today our proposed program for the Ford car line to be introduced in 50. Now it's up to the product planning committee. Is this the vehicle we want to offer to the public in 1950X? Here in this meeting, a decision will be made, a direction taken. Changes will be made, certainly. Suggestions offered. But for all practical purposes, here will be decided what the car or truck or tractor of three years from now will be. And the amazing part of it is this. Not a single line has been styled, not a single model has been made. No one knows at this moment of decision what this vehicle will look like. When the vehicle program has been approved, it becomes the job of our engineering staff to fill in the skeleton of the package with steel and chrome and fabric and rubber and glass. Now actual styling and design can start. From the stockpile of ideas and concepts and shapes, from the creative minds of Ford stylists and engineers, from the developmental programs constantly in progress, our future vehicle begins to take shape around the package. Package dimensions are translated into styling trends. Lines and forms and contours, both functional and pleasing to the eye. From hundreds of sketches, dozens of ideas are rendered from which the product planning committee, with recommendations by the vehicle division, will choose a styling direction. idea here, a line there, this fender contour, that windshield, a seating buck, the interior dimensions interpreted physically, comfort, convenience, roominess made certain, visibility and safety checked out. Then three-eighth size clay models. The vehicle begins to take on three dimensions. How does it look now, with depth? At the same time, intensive work going on in development and design of vehicle components. Engines, chassis components, transmissions, body and electrical components. Checks with manufacturing engineering. Plastic models used to make certain the styling and arrangement are feasible for manufacture. Changes suggested to save time in fabricating, machining, assembling. Full-size clay models made. Exterior surfaces approaching their final form. Front end and grille finalized. Trim combinations, colors and fabrics presented. The best of them chosen. And all the time, testing going on in engineering. Thousands of hours in the laboratory. Thousands of miles on the road. Performance and durability and safety tests for every basic component. The months are flying by now. The introductory dates are getting closer. We're fighting time every step of the way. Time and cost. And regular reports are being made to the committee on the progress of the program. In engineering, they're starting to put together the prototypes of the vehicle. Handmade jobs from the bottom up. Then more testing, more modification and improvement. Advanced information prints go out to manufacturing and purchasing so that equipment and facilities can be planned. Sources lined up for tools and dyes and purchased materials. 
And finally, we've reached the end. The program, started more than four years before, reaches its culmination. We're ready to roll job number one off our assembly line. done a good job this time. We've styled and designed and built the car that Jim Johnson and thousands like him wanted. But we don't stop there. We can't. If you stand still in this business, you go backward. We're already developing our objectives for the vehicle he'll want four years from now. Determining package dimensions and specifications for the car he'll buy three years from now. Finalizing the styling he'll admire two years from now. And the car he'll drive next year is already being tooled up and prototypes are being tested. It never stops. That's product planning at Ford. A long look into the future with but a single objective, leadership in car styling, in car performance, in car ownership, and always better tomorrow on the American road. Years ago, the Ford mass production idea spread all around the world, creating new jobs. And now, there are Ford people at work on every continent. Let's let a few of them introduce themselves. My name is Norman Florchuk. I work on the Ford Farm Line in the Dearborn Assembly Plant, USA. My name is Dennis Wetherill. I work on the final assembly of the Ford Motor Works, Dingenham, England. My name is Hugo Schwabenbacher. I work on the Ford Motor Company, Belgium. And it is here at the end of the assembly line. My name is Joaquim Valença. I work on the final line of montage of the Fabrica Ford in São Paulo. My name is Keith Dalton. I work on the final line of the Ford Australia assembly plant. Something you notice about Ford products around the world. They are designed to meet the needs of local customers. These are the English Fords. Here is a German Ford. And in other parts of the world, like Brazil, you see the familiar American Ford. Even at home, no one car can satisfy everyone. The modern car is a kind of living room on wheels. Mobility with style, beauty, and comfort. Changing desires and the American idea of continual progress keep engineers and stylists working in a future world where reality is laboriously constructed from the nebulous material of advanced thought. Here are dreams of graceful new power for moving us in the wider, more exciting world that is unfolding for everyone. Are these the models we will soon see on the American road? Not necessarily. These are combinations of many elements suggested for future design. The elements are developed part by part by Ford people who work with tangible dreams of line, design, color, fabric, and detail, as well as sculptured metal. Sculpturing begins with clay models, here in full size, kept exquisitely accurate with precise instruments. Trucks go through much the same stages as passenger cars. When any new truck or car is finally produced in metal and powered with an engine, it is turned over to the people at the proving ground. These men are the first riders the new models ever have. Test drivers and engineers, 
whose job it is to find out how cars will perform under any and all driving conditions and how to bring about peak performance for future owners. people believe the particular product they help to build is a member of a family of products to be proud of. Such pride of production continues on to become pride of ownership when you take delivery of the car from the Ford people you are most apt to have contact with. The dealer who is a businessman in your own hometown. He sells cars to be sure. But he is offering something more. He is offering mobility and an expanded world to live in. Just what this means you know best of all when you get around the country and see the things that are shared by all free-moving travelers. people themselves have provided a tourist attraction that is one of the most popular in the country. This is the rotunda, the show place of the auto industry at Dearborn, the birthplace of the Ford idea. Sometimes we look back to go ahead. Only a decade or so ago, there was a car, a car that gained such wide acceptance that it became a classic in its own time. When the Ford people were ready to produce a new kind of car, a car of tomorrow that was conceived to be the finest in the world, it had an enviable reputation before it was born, because they called it the Continental. Great new engineering power and construction were worked out. The problem was this, how to create a new Continental with the rakish charm of the classic and still have an automobile to inspire future stylists for years to come. The design went through development stages. Finally, one that captured the best of everything emerged. Sixteen thousand four hundred Michigan Avenue. Here took place a significant development in automotive history. On August 20, 1952, two men drove up to these old buildings. They were looking for a place to go to work on an idea. William Clay Ford already had been thinking about the idea for two years. He and an automotive engineer were looking for a building to set up a new organization. It had all begun back in 1939, when Edsel Ford, Bill's father, had designed a very special car. At first, it was not intended to be manufactured and sold. It was built as Edsel Ford's personal automobile. It was called the Lincoln Continental. It became a classic in its own time. Yet in all, only 5,322 were ever built. With the tremendous demand for volume-produced automobiles after World War II, manufacture of the Continental was suspended in 1948. But it never really passed from the scene. Even fan clubs of Lincoln Continental owners were organized, and people kept asking, when are they going to start making the Continental again? Now, in 1952, 
the work was actually underway in the gymnasium of the old schoolhouse. There were many questions. How should this car look? Should it resemble the old Continental? Or should it be a wholly new conception? Two points were clear. It must recapture the crisp styling of the old Continental. It must take its place at the head of an established family of fine cars. Into this new frame, a special passenger compartment was engineered with a new low roof line, but with the same amount of room inside. But when they finished this basic engineering, they had only begun. Now, they had to style it, design a new shape into which this new engineering package would fit. Bill Ford had a broad styling concept, which he called modern formal. There was still more than a year ahead of exploring on this alone. Sometimes they thought they had it. And then they knew they didn't. the finest car in the world didn't come overnight. By the end of 1952, they had come to the basic agreement, a decision on the general overall proportions of this new Continental. introduce the element of competition, a styling assignment on the new car was given to four outside automotive designers who would come up with independent ideas. All the designs had to conform to a grid laid out like a transparent checkerboard. Artist drawings can often be deceptive. The grid ensured that approved specifications were met and all the renderings were to be in the same color, Prussian blue, so that all the pictures could be compared objectively. In the meantime, the division's own stylists were coming up with their version. It would be a fair and open competition. Fifth, 1953. When everything was set, the members of a special products committee were brought in one by one to make their decision. Each was to choose by number the design he thought was the right one. design would they select? It was a great moment for Bill Ford's group when the results were in. The design they had created was the final choice. This was the one management decided to bet on. It was a multi-million dollar gamble. But was this to be the Continental of tomorrow? Not by quite a bit, but it was a solid beginning. At the old school buildings, there was still plenty of midnight oil to be burned before the design would be completed. But now they could at least begin to think ahead to the problems of manufacture, of tooling and production. There were new questions now. Questions on construction of a plant in which to build this car on a virtually custom basis. 
That planning could now get underway, while further refinements of design were plotted, sketched out, discarded, or adopted. While scale models were built and studied and modified, while full-size clay and plaster continentals were shaped and reshaped to achieve what the engineers and stylists wanted. September 29, 1953. It was as a plaster car that the new Continental received final approval. But a mock-up like this is really only a kind of three-dimensional picture. No drive it and see it the way it would really come to life, in motion. Based on what was decided about it in lifeless plaster, a copy in metal was the final step. This meant more months of planning and detail work. be impossible to say just what day or what hour this new car was actually born because it came to life a little at a time during the intensive effort of two years. But as good a day as any was December 24, 1954, the day before Christmas. prototype was at last ready for its trial run. There came the instant when the wheels turned under power for the first time. Everything that had gone before was preparation. This was the beginning for Continental Mark II. Of course, there was a tremendous amount of work to do yet before it could be manufactured on an assembly line. It would have to go through a complete and tough test pattern. Check its performance in desert heat. and under winter conditions that were more severe than any place on Earth. It ran for weeks on durability runs without ever stopping except for gas and oil. And in a blackout disguise, it traveled from coast to coast before final approval was given. And it was checked again and again for style photographed and re-photographed against all kinds of backgrounds. For engineers and stylists knew that in creating this new car, they had also created a new personality in a family of automobiles. But before the first future owner could take delivery, there were a few thousand details involved in getting production underway. A new car, a new company division. Now, a whole new plant to be built. And production in that new plant on the expressway just out of Dearborn is unlike any other production operation in the automobile industry. Relatively few cars are finished each day. Each individual engine is checked out on the dynamometer. Every body is first assembled and checked then, taken apart, numbered, and the sections painted as a set, assigned to one particular car. A painstaking painting process with four double coats of paint. Each double coat is sanded and baked before the next is applied. Wheel covers are hand assembled rather than welded producing a superior chrome finish. Higher standards in plating techniques were set to provide a chrome trim that would last unblemished for years. Hand-fitted leather goes into interiors of every car. Not just the prototypes, but every Continental made 
goes out for a severe road test. And the results of the test will be checked down to the performance of every bolt. So this is the way it happened. Over a period of more than four years, the concept of modern formal styling came to light. Growing from rough designers, engineers, and stylist sketches to a specially designed plan. And with it, new products, new jobs, carrying on a tradition, a tradition of progress. And here, tradition is brought forward ready for tomorrow. It was a challenge they offered these men, who in 1952 set out to capture the best traditions of an American classic, the Continental. And today, they find tomorrow is still ahead of them. Continental Mark II is finished, but the job of keeping it ahead is the challenge for the future. You're going to see the car they all said couldn't be built. All except the folks at Ford, that is. Here, making its first appearance on the Ford Show, is the new Ford Skyliner, the world's only hideaway hardtop. Now, you may think you're looking at a longer, redesigned Ford Victoria. But what you're really seeing is an engineering miracle the kind that can only come from Ford. And if you think the word miracle is an exaggeration, you just watch. Would you do the honors, please? All you do is pull the control button, and the magic starts. First, the Skyliner's longer deck lid opens up wide. Next, the all-steel roof unlocks itself and swings up. The forward panel here folds under, and the top continues to move back, and then down. All of this sort of makes you wonder what those masterminds at Ford Engineering are going to think up next, doesn't it? The top vanishes completely into the trunk. The deck lid closes down over it, and finally, automatic screws lock it tight into place. Well, you saw it. From a steel hardtop to a wide-open convertible in less than a minute. Was I right in calling this car an engineering miracle? I'll say it is. It's the car of the future, just as sure as its name is Ford. people who will never drive anything but a fabric top convertible. It has always been a sportier looking car, lower, better styled. Despite the occasional inconvenience of the convertible, like leaving the car with the top down and having it suddenly rained on, some convertible owners love more than anything else the airy, light feeling of driving with only a fabric cover above them. A cover that can be whisked away in seconds to leave them free as the open air or closed in seconds to protect them from the elements. Fabric top lovers there are, and fabric top lovers there will always be. And then there's another type of automobile buyer. Here's a man who's always wanted a convertible. Maybe he even used to own one and remembers it with pleasure. But for one or more of various reasons, perhaps concern for his family, for example, Many a man who would like to own a convertible must insist on the solidity and security of a steel roof car and resign himself never to enjoy the pleasures of an open automobile. Up to now, 
The closest such a man could come to his desires was the so-called hardtop convertible, which, of course, is not really a convertible at all. But people have been working on this problem. It has long been the dream of automotive designers to perfect the true hardtop convertible, a car with a steel roof that would retract out of sight, leading an open-air car. However, design after design has been rejected as impractical. That is, until today. Today, Ford, which led the industry to the V8, to ball joint suspension, to modern styling, and to many, many other engineering and design advances, once again proves its leadership of the automotive world with the Fairlane 500 Hideaway Hardtop. is the car of the future, the car that other manufacturers are still only dreaming about, the car that brings great prestige to Ford and Ford dealers for being first to offer the hard top design that within 10 years will be almost standard in the industry. Longer, three inches longer than the Fairlane 500 Sunliner, heavier, weighing almost 250 pounds more than its cloth top counterpart, the Fairlane 500 Hideaway Hardtop is the most beautiful car on the road today. Just look at the flat, streamlined route that signals another new kind of Ford. Indeed, a new kind of car. Yes, just look at it. about 50 seconds, less than a minute to change from a hard top to an open air car, the world's first and only true hard top convertible. That's the Fairlane 500 Hideaway Hard Top. How is this miracle of automotive engineering accomplished? How in the world does it work? Seven small electric motors, permanently sealed and lubricated for their lifetime, provide the power to operate the fully automatic top. A system of limit switches operates the motors in sequence for safe, dependable operation. The top can be raised or lowered with the ignition key in the accessory position or with the engine running. However, the transmission must be in neutral for the sake of safety. Then simply push in and hold the top operating button and the automatic mechanism takes over completely. Let's watch the top move up into place. First, the deck lid rises. When fully open, the lid hits a limit switch, which starts the top raising motors. The top moves up and forward. As it does so, a system of levers pulls the front roof section gradually into position. Finally, the entire top drops down and is electrically locked in place by the electric top locking motor. Now the package tray is folded under for storage. When folded completely, it hits a limit switch which starts the deck lowering motors. When the deck is completely lowered, it too is electrically locked into position by another locking motor. Amazingly enough, the entire top mechanism is so perfectly counterbalanced that the top can be raised or lowered and locked by the seven small motors using no more current than a cloth top convertible. And all motors, remember, are permanently sealed and lubricated for their lifetime. 
To provide maximum space for the top and the rear deck, the spare tire is under a floor plate where it can be easily reached on those rare occasions when it is needed. How about luggage? Where does that go? There's room for plenty of luggage in the rear deck, more even than in the Sunliner convertible. And to reach it, simply hold the operating button in the raised position until the deck lid is fully opened. Release the button, the mechanism stops, and your luggage is at your fingertips. Luggage space is, of course, limited when the top is down, but people rarely take long trips in an open car. When you've removed the luggage you need, simply press the button the other way to lower, and the deck lid moves back into place, securely locked. Notice, too, that fueling of the hideaway hardtop is accomplished through an access door in the left rear fender. And that about finishes up the major styling and engineering differences between the new hideaway hardtops and other Fairlane 500s. The new Fairlane 500 hideaway hardtop. A beautiful new kind of car. A major contribution to automotive design that you would expect from Ford, the leader of the industry. Here is a car that will join America's favorite convertible in offering the wonderful pleasures of open-air driving to the public. All the strength, solidity, and security of a steel top, plus a truly remarkable engineering accomplishment to achieve the world's first and only hideaway hardtop. It's the car of the future, and once again, the industry will have to follow the leader, Ford. day to be outside, isn't it? You know, that's one of the things I like about working in a western. It keeps me out in the open. Well, I feel the same way about a car, too. That's why I drive a convertible. There it is, the Ford Sunliner. Go ahead, take a closer look at it. The Sunliner is the world's all-time favorite convertible. And it's sure easy to see why. It's got the clean, sleek lines of a real thoroughbred. And it's got a lot of luxury features that you wouldn't expect to find in a low-priced car like this thick door-to-door -door carpeting. The top is made of a tough, fade-resistant material, and the seams are double-stitched and double-sealed to make it extra weather-tight. That's something you won't find in other low-priced convertibles. But this Sunliner is only one of three different Ford convertibles. Over there's another, the Ford Skyliner, the world's only retractable hard top. Now here comes a convertible everyone would love to own, the Thunderbird convertible. Why don't you stop by your Ford dealers and look over the only complete line of convertibles in America, the 59 Ford convertibles. I'll tell you this, they're my kind of cars. Under this canvas cover is one of the best kept secrets in the automobile business. We hope you'll help us keep it a secret until after the public showings. It's the newest member of the Ford family of fine cars, the Edsel. As you may know, the Edsel will be publicly introduced on September 4th. A great deal of planning has gone into getting ready for that day. And now, here is the Edsel story. <laughs> I 
I'm Dick Crafty, General Manager of the Edsel Division. And it's my privilege to be able to bring to you today, with the help of Emma Judge, who is our Merchandising and Product Planning Manager, the story behind the car under this cover. Most people are unaware that the Ford Motor Company has been thinking and planning the Edsel car for 10 years. Our roots are not a mere two years deep in the company, but in reality, 10 years. It was in 1948 that Ford Motor Company first began thinking about the introduction of another car in the medium price field. It was Henry Ford II who originally suggested the idea. But the company had more pressing problems at that time, as you all well know. However, a year later in 1949, we made the first presentation of the proposal to the executive committee. At that time, we referred to it not as the Edsel, but as the intermediate car. We received approval of the program and started the styling of the automobile. It was well planned in terms of preliminary engineering in 1950 when the Korean War came along. I'm sure you are all well aware of the impact of that particular event. We could not have sold a single additional automobile by having another car during a war-directed economy. We discontinued the program, although a great deal of study went on in the meantime. Finally, in the fall of 1954, the program was represented to the executive committee. The designation E-Car program was attached to the undertaking at that time, and active styling work was started in late 1954. The program was approved by the board of directors on April 15, 1955. In the two years that followed, we completed the styling and engineering of the car, created an organization which now totals 1,500 people, and have underway the creation of a dealer organization. The big event we are all waiting for is the culmination of not only two years of work and development, but the satisfaction of completing a job of some ten years duration. And now for the moment I'm sure you've all been looking forward to. A look at the newest member of the Ford family of fine cars, the Edsel. the car that is already making automotive history for Ford Motor Company. A new and different car in every respect, yet with a classical element of conservatism in its styling, which will give it maximum appeal. Its flowing, graceful lines Sculptured into the sheet metal are clean and dignified. Yet it is excitingly different from anything on the road today. The car you are looking at here is the Citation the top series in the Edsel line. In addition, as you know, we will offer three other series, the Ranger, the Pacer, and the Corsair, which will compete right across the medium price market. Edsel will offer in its four series, a total of 18 body styles, including a full line of station wagons. Every one of them will be tops in its field in styling, performance, and features. Here are some of the new features which will be introduced in the Edsel this fall. This is our Teletouch transmission control. You can drive the Edsel, park it, and reverse it with ease. A flick of the Teletouch button makes an electrical contact, and a motor engages the transmission. This instrument cluster follows the most advanced automotive developments. 
we placed all instrument switches and warning signals for convenience and visibility. This dial temp heater and ventilation control tunes in temperature, ventilation, and even optional air conditioning. In place of the old-fashioned knobs, you select the climate you want with a twist of the wrist. These visual reminders help you watch oil pressure, fuel level, oil level, and engine temperature. They also tell whether the generator is charging and whether the emergency brake is off. Preset this dial at the speed you want. When you exceed this speed, the speedometer dial lights up red in warning. A big reason for the outstanding performance of the Edsel is the E475 engine in this citation. The engine is named for the 475 foot-pounds of torque it develops. This torque is usable power. Another top-selling feature of the Edsel. You'll want to take a closer look at the Edsel so that you can help tell America about the newest car in the Ford family. Edsel cars will go on display in advance of public showings in most company locations beginning August 27th. Don't miss seeing it. some great adventures begin. say what excitement and unexpected pleasures they will eventually bring, and to whom. Some will go east, some west. Some will find a home near, others far. But in each, there is inbuilt freedom of movement, a means to far-flung travel joy for anyone, not only on the open road, but off the beaten path besides. This one, for instance. Now, where do you suppose it's bound? And to whom will it belong? define happiness when you have everything you've ever wanted. And coming up, 
two weeks with the most wonderful man in the world, in the mountains of Grand Teton National Park. Thank you.